Let's translate Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. It's a large portion of scripture. We're going to cover it quickly today. It's fascinating. I have translated it in the past in my commentary, and we will even reference that later today. But what, what is it about? It's about submission in the church, and how does it apply to the family? And specifically, this portion covers in the marriage relationship. How do wives submit to their husbands? And likewise, how do husbands submit to their wives? Let's dive in. So I've already taken the liberty to diagram it uh, because it's going to take a long time to cover. And so it's already diagrammed and ready to go. And here is a close-up view. But if I if I back it up a bit, here's a bird's eye view. Oh, we still need to go a little further. It's, it's that large. There we go, 120%. So it's a very large passage and it's really detailing what submission looks like for wives and then for husbands. And you can see that the instruction in verse 21 is submitting to one another in fear of Christ. So this is submission. Now, fear of Christ, this is uh, tied to wisdom and the fear of the Lord, which is what this entire section of chapter 5 is all about. Wisdom. And so what is wise living? Well, it's submitting to one another. What does it mean to submit to one another? Well, wives, you will submit. There's no verb here. So the verb is implied and supplied implicitly from the previous verse, which is submitting. So wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. Let's zoom in here. So wives, submit. It's implicit to your own husband and this is plural, hus husbands, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So this act of submission to your husband is actually an act of submission to the Lord. Just as you submit to the Lord, you submit to your husband. So Paul is effectively making submission an action of service to the Lord. You're not serving your husband, you're serving the Lord. This service is in the form of submission because a man is head of the wife, or you can translate this of his wife, as also Christ is head. There's no verb, so it's implied. Again, same technique. We, we take the previous verb and supply it as Christ is head of the church. He is, taking the same verb, he is savior of the body. But as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands in all things or in everything. So you can see this technique is reoccurring where the verb is missing. You have to take it from the context. And uh, that's the link between wives and the previous statement submitting to one another out of fear of Christ. What's cool is this instruction to wives makes clear what in fear of Christ is. Okay, you submit as to the Lord. You know, we submit to Christ, we're going to submit to one another. Wives, you're specifically going to submit to your husbands. Then husbands, collectively, you love your wives. This is the most strongest command you could have. This is an imperative. Love your wives. This is with an exclamation mark. If they had all caps, which they did, although they didn't use it the same way we do in the modern sense, this would be in all caps and we would be shouting. Love your wives, just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her or on her behalf. We'll just say for her. In order to, or in order that he might sanctify her cleansing with the washing of water in word we'll say in the word in order to or in order for or in order that he might present to himself the church in splendor not having spot or blemish or any such thing but in order that it might be, or she might be, holy and blameless or spotless. Just as also, 
or rather, so also, so also husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. The one who loves his wife loves himself. He goes on to explain for no one ever hated his flesh, but nourish nourishes and cherishes it, meaning the flesh. Just so also Christ nourishes and cherishes the church. So again, we see this principle of the previous verbs standing in implicitly nourishes the church, cherishes the church because we are a member of his body. Now we have a scripture quote from Genesis 2:24. So antituto for this reason a man will leave father and mother and will be united with his wife and the two will become unto one flesh. That's the end of Genesis 2:24 and then we have this is a great mystery. What's a great mystery? The joining of the two into one flesh? But I am speaking about Christ and about the church. The great mystery is not the union, the marital union of humans. The mystery is the joining of Christ and the church. Nevertheless, also you. Now, you here is plural, so it's y'all. You all, y'all. And then he singles everyone out. So you've got the large group, you. Then you have this distributive phrase, you meaning each one of you. So let each one love his wife as himself. So there's this large group of men in the church in Ephesus, and he calls upon every single one of them. Not a single husband in Ephesus is off the hook. Every single one of them is charged to love his own wife as he loves himself. Then he contrasts that going back to wives. So we have a chiasm here. This whole section starts with wives, then moves to husbands. Then at the end, after the scripture quote, returns to husbands, and then lastly returns to wives. That's a chiasm. But wives, or you could say, and the wife, ina phobite, is normally in order that or in order to sometimes it could be so that here however it's probably simply just the wife will love the wife will fear or respect her husband so that's how to translate ephesians 5 21 through 33. let's look at some of the vocabulary i've got some merch here you can see the kyrios jesus this is jesus is lord this is the trucker hat version it's quite nice. It's got the black gray scheme. It is a Richardson hat snapback. So if you like those trucker hats like I do, you might like that. If you don't like that, there's a um, shirt, another kind of hat and a sweatshirt. If you're interested, I would appreciate the support. It's not required, but it's available if you want it. Ipotasso is the main uh, verb. It's actually not a main verb in verse 21. It is a participle, but it's the overarching theme for the rest of our section and normally means to be submissive in a relationship to sub subject yourself to subordinate in the uh, passive sense it's to become subject to subject oneself be subjected or subordinated that is to obey and of submission involving recognition of an ordered structure with dative of the entity to whom which appropriate respect is shown so Ipotasso here is submitting to one another. Respect each other. Now you can see BDAG says of submission in the sense of voluntary yielding in love. Ephesians 5.21. But inherent in this idea is respect. And that is why in verse 33, he doesn't repeat Ipotasso. He says to fear, which is to respect. So let's jump down to phobeome. This is phobeo. Normally, it means f something like flee in terror, to be afraid, become frightened. But in the sense of profound measure of respect for, to have reverence, respect, this is with special reference to fear, fear of offending, don't offend. This is for persons who command respect, 
It could be a father, a mother. It can be of a husband. So respect is the underlying idea of the word submit. You respect one another and you do that in fear of Christ. Respect is within our, our grasp here. If you look, ipotasomeni alilis en phobo Christo. Phobo, this is phobos, fear. This is the noun cognate to phobeo. So when I say submission is tied to respect, there it is in, in plain Greek. We have submit, we have fear. They are related. So that's ipotasso. So I'm curious to know from your perspective, what does it mean, ipotasso? What does it mean to submit to one another? Let me know in the comments down below what you think. And then we have wives, one's own, husbands, os is comparative, the Lord, kafali. This is a good one. This is the part of the body that contains the brain, the head. But it's also a being of high status. In the case of living beings, it denotes superior rank. Look, in the patriarchal society that was the ancient Near East, or that is the ancient Near East, and that was the biblical times of, of Jesus and Paul, husbands were the head of the household. That's a familiar phrase, is it not? We still use that today. I just had someone come to my door the other day. Hey, may I speak to the head of the household? Speaking, how can I help you? So this isn't nothing new. So the father is the head of the household, the head of the family. Likewise, the husband is the head of the wife. Now, whether you agree with that or not in, in modern understanding, I really don't care, but that's what the text says. The husband is the head of the wife. Why? Because Christ is the head of the church. So in effect, the husband represents Christ. In effect, the church is represented by the wife. This will be important later. Christ saves the body, the body being the church. Now, because of that, the church submits to Christ. Now, just as the church submits to Christ, because Christ is the savior of the body, the church, then so also wives are to submit to their husbands in all things. So the wifely relationship is modeled by the church relationship. The church is dependent upon Christ for its salvation. Now, Sotir, this is one who rescues, savior, deliverer, preserver. Uh, it is a title of divinities. It's also used as a title of honor for deserving persons. And it's used of high-ranking officials and of persons in private life. It's used of God. It's used of Christ, Savior of the body, i.e. of his body, the Christian community. But note that it's related to sozo, the cognate verb. This is important. I need you to see this. Because inherent in the idea of sotir is deliverer or preserver. So let's look at sozo. To preserve or rescue from natural dangers and afflictions. Save, keep from harm, rescue, save from death, bring out safely, save or free from disease, keep, preserve in good condition. In the passive, it has the sense of thrive, prosper, get on well, to save or preserve from transcendent danger or destruction. So the idea is the implicit analogy here, although it's not stated, not yet, is just as Christ is the savior of the church, which is his body. So also is the husband, the savior, that is preserver, protector of his body, which is his wife. Now, because of that, the wife will submit to her husband. All right. So that's essentially the argument that's being made here. That doesn't give the husband free reign to dominate his wife to abuse his wife. And that's why the very next phrase or the very next command is Paul addressing husbands and saying, husbands, love your wives. This is important because in ancient culture, Aristotle is quoted as saying, husbands, rule your wives. Not so with Paul, not so with Christianity. It is to be different. It's similar to the 
culture around. Wives, be subject to your husbands. It's different to the surrounding culture. No, 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 no. You don't, you don't rule your wives. You love them. You see the difference? So husbands, love your wives. Agapo. Agapao. This is to have a warm regard for and interest in another, to cherish, to have affection for, to love. And I'll, I'll point out in the Septuagint, agapao is one of the words for love making. Usually we hear, oh, there's three Greek words for love. There's brotherly love, phileo. There's uh, the New Testament love of, of agapao. And then there is eros, which is the erotic love. Yeah, well, agapao is the erotic love of the Septuagint. So I don't know what to tell you, except that uh, this word can be quite flexible in meaning. Uh, it can mean love making, but it can also mean cherish, have warm regard for, whether that's self-sacrificial or not. So love your wives. Why? Because Christ loved the church and he loved the church by giving himself up for the church. This is paradidomi to convey something in which one has a relatively strong personal interest, to hand over, give over, deliver, entrust. So hand over to suffering, death, punishment, especially in relation to Christ. That's exactly what happened. He handed himself over. He gave himself up on her behalf. Husbands are to love their wives in the same way. That is, give yourself up for her. Your job is to preserve her, protect her. Guess what? That's going to be a self-sacrificial love. Interesting, right? Just as Christ gave himself up for her, so should you. Give yourself up for your wife. That's the kind of love we're talking about. He did that. Christ did that in order to sanctify her, make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water in the word. Normally, word is logos, but here it's rima. It be word, saying, a statement of any kind. It's all divine teachings as a unified whole with some such meaning as gospel or confession. Interesting. Presenting her to himself as splendor, glorious, in doxos. Brilliant in purity, glorious, splendid. I, I think it's time we look at ecclesia here. So ecclesia, this is ek kaleo. So I call out. They are the called out ones. That's what the meaning of the church is. Regularly summoned legislative body, assembly, assemblage, gathering people with shared belief, community, congregation, global community of Christians, universal church, not having spot, bilos, stain or blemish, retis, wrinkle, or any such thing, but in order that it might be, or she might be holy, holy means set apart, something that could approach a divinity because it's been set apart, dedicated to God, sacred, consecrated, pure and amomos, blameless, unblemished, without fault, morally blameless. Thus, ought, ophilo. So this is husband's ought. That means they should do something. This is to be indebted to someone in a financial sense. So you owe something to someone or to be under obligation to meet certain social or moral expectations. You owe it to someone. And because you owe it, you are obligated. You must do this. You ought to do this. So because Christ has saved you, he has given himself up for you, and he has cleansed you, he's washed you, he has made you spotless, he has made you holy and consecrated. Therefore, so also must you love your wife and you are to do so as though she is your own body. Let me ask you something. Do you love yourself? Do you feed yourself? Do you make sure you get yourself some rest? Do you work? And then do you play? Do you have hobbies? Do you nourish your interests? Do you feed your soul? Do you feed your brain? Do you preserve your own life? You love yourself. And guess what? You are to love your wife as yourself. Because guess what? She is your body. The one who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his flesh. 
flesh. That's a Hebrew sort of term here. If you look at the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, flesh is a direct reference to one's wife. But this is an analogy. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes. So miseo is to hate, detest, have a strong aversion towards. No one has a strong aversion towards his own flesh, but instead ektrefo, you nourish, you provide food, or in the sense of children, you rear, you bring up, but that rearing is through nourishment. And then thalpo, this is to cherish. This is comfort. You provide warmth and it's because Christ does that for the church. And so the husband is to follow Christ's lead. The wife is to follow the church's lead. The husband is to follow Christ's lead. And Christ does that. Why? Because we, the members of the church, are members, melos. We are parts. We are limbs. We're part of the human body. We are uh, members of the whole. So this is a figurative extension of the previous definition. We are members of the whole. We're part of the body, part of his body. And this is all tied to Genesis 2, 24 and, and uh, the two become one flesh, right? The man will leave his father and mother and will be united to adhere closely, be faithfully devoted to, join. This is to stick to, glue on, be stuck to, stick, cleave to, a gluing to, a fixing, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and the church. Nevertheless, also you, each one of you, let each one love his own wife as himself and the wife in order that she might fear the husband. It's possible for Ina Fobite to simply just be a regular old command. It's on the more rare usage, I would say, in the New Testament. Usually this is going to mark the subjunctive in order that, so a purpose or result clause. It can just simply be a roundabout command, simple command. And the wife will love her husband. I'm going to say will love because that makes it sound like a command. And that's what we have. Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. You might be asking yourself, what is this phrase, e kath ena, or emis e kath and uh, well, I covered it here in my blog, which is actually a commentary you can buy, but all the way down here, you, each one, let each. It's a very rough translation of the Greek text. The location of the comma between ena and ekastos is confusing. Why does the article follow emis? What is kata doing in the phrase, i.e. how's it functioning? The phrase emphasizes the group, emis, you. By placing it first, the preposition kata, each, is functioning distributively here. We can therefore translate kath ena as individually. Furthermore, the article preceding kata is not only referencing back to imis, but is also part of the distributive phrase kath ena. And we should take the article with the distributive phrase while realizing that it links the phrase as a reference to imis, literally, you, the ones individually. But what do we make of ekastos? There's normally an emphatic force with kat plus is plus ekastos. However, this force comes only when we have matching cases. In this instance, we have an accusative, ena, plus a nominative, ekastos. These words cannot be understood together as an emphatic distributive phrase. Instead, they are separate. Paul starts with the group, transitions focus to the individual, and then instructs every individual. If we were to translate this phrase literally, it would be given this way. You, the ones individually, let each one. But this translation is awkward. If we understand the phrase idiomatically, with a special emphasis on the group, we can translate it with these words. Let each one of you. The subject of the text is, in fact, the group. But Paul is singling out every individual in that group all at once with the same instruction. If you want, you can see my blog posts for free, but I do have a book. You can get it digitally or you can get a hardbound copy. And it's right here. The link will be in the description down below. The ebook is right here with the blue cover. 
It's two dollars ten cents. It's about 140 pages worth, or you can get the hard copy. It's twelve ninety five. Again, about 145 pages. It says 186 here, but that's just because of the the printing process. But they print on demand. It'll show up, or you can go find it on Amazon. However you want to do it, I really don't care. But it's optional if you want it. You've got that. If you found this video helpful, hit the like button, subscribe, and watch this video covering Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7, when the Lord really defines who he is to Moses. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.